Joshua trees are one of the National Park Service's most iconic species. Joshua Tree National Park in Southern California bears their name most prominently, but they can be found across the Mojave Desert into Nevada, Arizona, and Utah as well. This species faces significant conservation challenges, a topic I covered in detail in 2023. But in this video, I want to scale back a bit and almost give you like a digital fact sheet on Joshua trees. Like I said, they are an iconic species in the national park system and an iconic species in the southwestern United States, and I think it's worth taking just a few minutes to understand their natural history so that when you guys go out and see these trees in the park, you have a better understanding of what you're looking at and why their conservation is so important. All right, let's start with the name. They were first described in the scientific literature in 1871 by a man named George Engelman during the Wheeler Expedition, one of the four major surveys of the American West. Engelman gave them the scientific name Yucca brevifolia, and for a long time, they were classified as part of the lily family, but with recent genetic testing have actually been placed into the agave family of succulents, which are plants that store water. The Cahuila tribe referred to them as Hunuvut Chia or Humwichiwa, while the Spanish name for them, Izote de Desierto, translates as Desert Dagger. Now, even with their recent reclassification, taxonomists are still arguing over how best to describe Joshua trees. There are Western Joshua trees, which are the ones you will find in Joshua Tree National Park, and then there are Eastern Joshua trees found in Arizona and Nevada, and then there's like a third subspecies as well. Some taxonomists, though, would argue that the Eastern Joshua tree is actually its own distinct species. We'll leave that for them to figure out. The name Joshua Tree is even a little controversial. As the stories go, Joshua Trees got their common name from Mormon settlers moving west, who likened the gangly branches to the biblical figure Joshua, supplicating himself and guiding them further west. Another story goes that the Joshua Tree resembled the biblical figure in a different way that of a wartime leader. The sharp blade-like leaves of the Joshua trees spread out across the desert were said to resemble the forces of Joshua's army. But none of these stories have been historically corroborated, and in fact the name Joshua Tree actually post-dates Mormon settlement. So like with many a good origin story, we may never know the truth about the name Joshua Tree. But we do know the truth about lots of other stuff when it comes to this famous succulent. For one, they have very specific habitat requirements. They're a mid-elevation desert species, most prominently found in the Mojave Desert of California, Arizona, Utah, and Nevada. The Sonoran Desert is too hot for them, and the Great Basin Desert is too cold, so they actually occupy this sort of happy middle ground between the two. In fact, Joshua Tree National Park actually straddles the line between the Sonoran Desert and the Mojave Desert. And if you enter the park from the south, you're in the Sonoran Desert. And as you drive Pinto Basin Road further north into the park, as you gain elevation, you will transition into the Mojave and you will start to see Joshua trees. They appear more prominently. Their sweet spot for elevation is actually roughly between 1,300 and 6,000 feet of elevation. And in addition to their very specific habitat requirements, they also have very specific reproduction conditions. The process kicks off in the winter as Joshua trees actually require a crisp winter freeze to stimulate flowering. The freeze actually damages the growing end of a Joshua tree branch, which then in the spring is actually where a flower will start to grow from. Also, the freeze stimulates branching. So if you're looking at a Joshua tree with several branches, you know that Joshua tree has flowered. If you're looking at an unbranched Joshua tree, you know that it has never flowered. And the more branches a Joshua tree has, the more flowers it has likely produced. And I say likely because Joshua trees still rely on spring rain showers to provide them with the necessary moisture for flowering. And to top it all off, if that flower is produced, Joshua tree flowers are only pollinated by a single species, the yucca moth. Joshua trees actually have what we call a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with yucca moths, meaning that both the Joshua tree and the yucca moth benefit from their relationship. The Joshua tree gets its flowers pollinated, it's keyed for it to reproduce, and the yucca moth gets a place to lay its eggs inside of the Joshua tree flowers. Both species benefit from this arrangement. 
Joshua trees can also reproduce asexually by sprouting from roots and branches, a useful adaptation that allows them to recover from events like floods or fires. But you can start to see why this species has such a significant set of conservation challenges, right? They only grow in very specific places and they only reproduce in very specific conditions. If those places and those conditions are disrupted, Joshua trees will have a much harder time recovering from those disturbances than, say, a species that can grow anywhere and reproduce very easily. I covered those challenges in detail in my Joshua Tree Conservation video, link in the description if you'd like to check that out. Now, obviously Joshua trees don't exist in isolation in these desert environments. Deserts are actually very biodiverse places and Joshua trees are at the center of their Mojave desert ecosystems. Many species of birds, mammals, and reptiles rely on the Joshua tree for food, water, and shelter. For instance, certain birds like the Scots Oriole will build their nests in a Joshua tree's branches while ladder-backed woodpeckers nest in the trunk. Desert wood rats will actually climb up to the Joshua tree, harvest the leaves, and then bring them back down and use them as sort of a spiny set of defenses for their burrows. A desert night lizard may come to the Joshua tree in search of a meal, knowing that it provides refuge for yummy insects. Joshua trees can be a source of shade during the scorching summer months, are a key source of moisture in a very arid environment, and their seeds and fruits are high in nutritional value for all of those desert herbivores. Joshua trees are what we call a keystone species, meaning they provide the foundation for survival for all the other species which exist in this ecosystem. And now might be a good time to add that Joshua trees actually aren't even trees. Their trunks are more fibrous rather than woody, and they don't have growth rings like you would find in an actual tree. This actually makes it really hard to age them as well, since you can't just count the growth rings to see how old it is. And height isn't always the best indicator either, since Joshua trees will grow more during more favorable conditions, like when they've received a lot of rain. In general, Joshua trees can grow between 20 and 70 feet tall, but most of them will stay below 40 feet. They are generally thought to live about 150 years, but there's been a Joshua tree that's been dated to be over 1,000 years old, so there's a huge range of variability there. Again, their height and age is likely correlated with their growing conditions. More favorable conditions means bigger and older trees, which again is a problem since the conditions that Joshua trees are facing right now during our lifetimes are not very favorable. But nonetheless, they are still icons of the Mojave Desert and have drawn many a visitor to the parks and protected areas they inhabit. That might even include you. So whether you've seen them in person or not, I hope you now have a better understanding of these gangly, biblically inspired succulents. Let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see more videos like this one for other iconic national park species, plant or animal, and be sure to let me know which ones you would prefer. Be sure to follow me on Instagram. I'll be posting Hawaii and American Samoa pics over there very soon. Direct support on Patreon is always appreciated, and I host a newsletter over there on my free tier, completely free newsletter. Uh, all right, that's all I have for you. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.